Um, good morning, and thank you very much for being with us. We are honoured to have your presence and, and to share your wisdom on these very, very crucial issues before us, particularly non-proliferation of nuclear kind and uh, nuclear disarmament generally. Um, you, of course, are the president-to-be designate of the Revcon uh, review coming up in 2020, so you're in a pivotal position and obviously with a background of enormous experience and knowledge in all these areas. Now, I think what we would like very much to do is get a feeling from you on how do you see this uh, Revcon uh, conference shaping up and what you think the biggest challenges are going to be. That's rather a general question to start with and we'll back it up with some more specific ones, but could we just start with your overview of this important prospect. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the work you're doing. I think it's very important that in different places we reflect about this and we try to uh, contribute to what we hope will be a successful outcome for an exercise of global relevance, I believe. Um, Indeed, like you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm supposed to be uh, the one who is going to be steering this, this very important process, uh, presiding uh, over it. And of course, everything I will say is informed by that. By, by that. So my, my whole perspective and my analysis is, uh, of course, heavily influenced of, by uh, the possibilities we have the challenges we have, and how best to overcome them. Uh, so uh, this means that I try to transcend the, uh, and it's my duty actually, to try to transcend the partisan or regional or national or political um, approach to the different um, issues that are part of, of this treaty, which is, as you know very well, so particular because it has uh, different uh, aspects, different facets uh, to it. This conference comes at a very uh, particular time. It's the 10th uh, review conference since the entry into force of the treaty. And it's the conference of all anniversaries because it's the 10th, it's, it's the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of this treaty. So it's half a century. And it's also 25 years after, a quarter of a century after, we decided collectively that the treaty would have an indefinite extension. So all these things put in perspective give the occasion a special meaning, I would say. Anniversaries are, of course, arbitrary, but as in life, they are a good opportunity to take stock of where we are, what this, uh, this instrument is, is uh, giving us uh, in terms of um, uh, um, rule to conduct our activities in this field um, and uh, what are the prospects and challenges uh, for the future. I will not regurgitate what, I know, what you know, what I know you know, uh, everybody says that. It's a moment where uh, many of the things that we consider as basic going to the heart of the treaty are, uh, if not challenged, under great stress, meaning basically the uh, disarmament uh, provisions um, of the treaty. And also other important aspects that have to do with the political decisions that uh, allowed us to have this treaty as um, an instrument having indefinite duration. And with this, I refer to the thorny issue of the Middle East and the possible establishment of a weapons of mass destruction free zone in that part of the world. Um, but on, on, on top of that, we, we have other mm, aspects uh, dealing with, and I'll be coming back to that if you allow me, 
uh, having to do with the peaceful uses uh, and the non-proliferation. So the treaty, it's an, uh, it's, um, in all its uh, briefness, is, is incredibly rich uh, because it has uh, this, these different aspects and they are interplaying in a different way. So in my opinion, uh, we uh, should um, make every effort to have a, a review which is a success. And we can talk about that, if you want. Well, th thank you very much. I'm sorry, I should have said at the beginning and forgot, as Chairman, to remind you that this is a televised and open session, and there's a transcript afterwards which you can correct if you wish, and also very good. remind my colleagues about um, very interests and so on. But um, that, that is very helpful. Uh, now, we've got some follow-up questions, I know, but just first, I mean, some of our witnesses have suggested that this coming conference is the one where the non-nuclear states are beginning to lose a bit of patience with the balance inherent in the MPT structure and beginning to ask, well, where is this disarmament for, for the nuclear states coming from? Who's doing it? And why should we go on accepting this inherent structure that was held together for so long. Is that your impression as well, or do you think that's not a, not a major Well, issue? you know, there are <clears throat> different views on this. There are different views on this. It is clear that uh, the, in the provisions of the treaty, you have one article, which is Article 6 of the treaty, which uh, has provision for uh, a, a, a process leading to uh, eventually to a world without nuclear weapons. But there are no, um, there's no chronology or, or specifically set uh, timelines uh, for that. Uh, there is, uh, of course, a big debate about the pace, uh, the results, the concrete results that uh, have been achieved so far, and on this, Again, uh, there are different views. Um, my impression is that um, there is a concern about this, and uh, it is up to all of us as a, as, a, as a community, as an NPT community, to address this. I don't see necessarily this as something that should be confronting nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. The one quality this treaty has is that we are all parties in it, and we all have obligations there. So the, the, um, the, the expectation would be that we uh, have, and this is why we have a, uh, this embedded system of review in the treaty, which is something that you don't have in every instrument of international law, as you know. So the review in itself indicates that there is this evolving nature of the instrument, which requires um, regular or from time to time checking on where we are. The question arises, coming to your um, reference to frustration, whether you know, 50 years uh, is a long time for nuclear disarmament if what you mean by frustration is people don't see nuclear weapons disappearing from the surface of the earth or whether we are talking about a sufficiently robust pace uh, in the disarmament uh, process. Quite clearly, the treaty is a treaty which is not, is, does not exist in a vacuum. And this is so important. We, we say 50 years, and God knows how many things we went through over the last 50 years. We started, I mean, this treaty was negotiated uh, at, 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 the, at the time of the Cold War, Vietnam War, uh, now, uh, we have uh, uh, this I cite just to indicate that this, this, this was not an easy moment in international life. And then it has uh, 
undergone or, or it has lived through uh, ups and downs, I would say, in the cycle of history, uh, you know, the, 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 the end of the Cold War, the post-Cold War, and then the emergence of new challenges that are there. And the treaty is overarching uh, all these um, events. The big question, I would think, for all of us, for the 191 members uh, um, of, of, of the treaty, will be uh, whether uh, the fact that uh, we haven't reached the final goal of a world without weapons is something that would put into question the NPT as such. That is nice. Yes. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You mentioned specifically the Middle East uh, weapons-free zone of, um, uh, as one of the challenges you face. I wonder if you could say just a little bit about how it was, of course, the challenge which led to the non-adoption of any agreed conclusions at the last review conference. I wonder if you could say just a little bit about how you think procedurally this issue can best be handled in the run-up to and at the conference. And could you also perhaps just comment a little about the situation of the four countries which will not be participating in the conference but which do have nuclear weapons, uh, India and Pakistan, who are actually conducting military operations against each other as we speak, although... Uh, thank heavens, so far not with any threat of or actual use of nuclear Indeed. weapons. Uh, Israel, which is of course an integral part of the discussion about the Middle East zone, uh, and North Korea, uh, which was a met party to the treaty but withdrew from it and now has nuclear weapons. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about the four after you've said a little bit about the Middle East weapons free zone? Certainly, with pleasure. Middle East of course, uh, is, uh, has become uh, a central issue in the NPT debate after uh, the review and extension conference, which took place in 1995, where a decision, a resolution was adopted, uh, which indicated that there should be movement towards, towards this which has been elusive, you know, and I suppose that in the process of your previous deliberations you may have been analysing how this process led to uh, efforts, diplomatic efforts, that were not successful, in particular after the 2010 uh, review conference, a decision was taken to appoint uh, an agreed facilitator appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations who conducted a very thorough process of consultations um, around the region, uh, but unfortunately uh, uh, no positive outcome um, came uh, out of that. So um, the, the, you were mentioning, Ambassador, that um, uh, in 2015, the last time round, uh, the issue was perhaps, it is said, uh, perhaps the one that made the whole uh, effort uh, failed, and it's possibly true, and it was again about finding uh, an adequate form of words to try to revive again, to extend again the possibility of this uh, process, uh, basically having a conference uh, to take place, to come about. Um, this time it's different um, because um, there is a new element in that, as you may know, at the last General Assembly, there was a decision to hold a conference which will take place uh, in New York, probably in the month of November or by the end of the year, uh, to deal with the issue of the denuclearization of, of the Middle East. So, um, I don't know what's going to happen at that conference, but it is clear that apart from what may or may not happen at the review conference, it is fair to say, objective to say, that there is a, a new process, another process, a parallel process, I don't know, you can qualify it any way uh, you wish, but clearly we will have to 
take that into consideration. What will happen in New York? Who will, who will, who will come to this conference? Uh, there was a predictable divide in voting uh, in New York about the decision to hold this conference. So it, it is, uh, as we speak, it is um, an open question whether you will have the United States attending, I don't know if the United Kingdom will take, will, will take part in the deliberations. I mean, all the other P5 countries, are they going to come or not? Is Israel going to be there or not? What is, uh, so there are many open questions, but what is, what is uh, relevant is that there is now uh, uh, a, new, a, a new path, an added path to this goal with, to which we all subscribed. This is something which we should uh, remember. This is not uh, an imposition from the Arab group. We all collectively in '95 said that we should uh, work on a, on a conference to uh, get to this uh, establishment of a nuclear weapon or you know, weapons of mass destruction free zone uh, in the area. So my um, answer to your the first part of your question would be that uh, come 2020, we will need to analyze this a little bit through the lens of what may or may not have happened at this conference. What will people say? Do people consider this as the process that should channel all efforts on this? Or do people want all of the above? NPT as well, and, and something in the NPT, and, and something uh, for, the, uh, for the conference itself. So it's like there is at least um, a duality of fora to deal uh, with this issue, which is not irrelevant. So that, is, that would be on the Middle East. On, 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 uh, on the non-NPT countries, I would say, of course, uh, they are uh, very relevant to the process. They are not parties to the treaty. They show interest, I must say, uh, and I, uh, you know, in my consultations, and, this will, and it will happen more, I suppose, I often uh, interact uh, with, with, with them. They follow very closely. They do say things about the NPT uh, regularly. Uh, you were mentioning India, for example. India considers that, apart from the fact that they have nuclear weapons, they are abiding by, yeah, you know, the, the main, if you want, the spirit of the NPT because they are responsible. And so I suppose Pakistan has also things to say about that, um, and even uh, Israel. So uh, they are observers that are quite close uh, to the process. Uh, but of course, uh, no one has any illusion that they will be joining uh, the treaty any time uh, soon. So this is not part of the deliberations uh, themselves. In the case of uh, North Korea, of course, uh, it's very uh, coincidentally, uh, we are having this uh, gathering uh, in parallel with the Hanoi uh, uh, summit. Uh, I think uh, this is an area where uh, the situation, one can fairly say, uh, looks uh, better than it did back in 2015. Uh, we, uh, we may not be aware of many of the details surrounding the, the negotiations and the consultations with, with South Korea that uh, back uh, a couple of years ago we were having a succession of nuclear tests, uh, every single one of uh, higher yield than the previous one. Uh, we were having a number of uh, ballistic missile uh, tests that were, of course, of enormous concern. And, and at the moment, we don't know what the outcome could be, but there is, uh, there is diplomatic uh, activity around the issue uh, at a bilateral level, granted. Uh, but I, I suppose that this is an area where, come 2020, we, we certainly wish... Uh, we will be able to register some, uh, some progress. Uh, 
Yes, we've heard, we've heard from previous witnesses about a fairly obvious question, I suppose, about what are the advantages, continuing advantages, to non-nuclear states of being in the uh, NPT, uh, sharing of civilian use and all the rest of it, civil use and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, as a kind of other, the other side of the um, spectrum, uh, the question I'd like to ask is what, what are the um, disadvantages to those states that are not signatories to the NPT, what are the disadvantages to them, if any, of remaining non-signatories? It seems to me that, um, well, you know, might as well if you uh, uh, carry on as, as things are. Uh, and unless some clear advantages become apparent, uh, then isn't it likely to remain pretty much as it is at the present? Well, thank you, Robert. Thanks for the question. I think the two parts uh, are very relevant, and, and I would like, if I have the opportunity, to talk a little bit about the advantages for, uh, for countries being part of the NPT, because this I intend to make uh, a considerable part of my effort, especially in the lead-up to the review conference. I will be having a number of uh, consultations and regional conferences specifically on that, so uh, we, 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 may, we may come back to that. But talking about the disadvantages, because you are, you are taking this, this particular angle, I think it's very relevant to say that the, the NPT has been such a success that uh, when uh, you, um, uh, countries that uh, may uh, violate or, or find themselves uh, in, in a position marginal to the NPT will have enormous trouble uh, internationally. We'll be referred to the Security Council, will have enormous costs of entry for whatever they may like to do um, in the peaceful uh, uses um, area, getting uh, technology, getting cooperation, let alone the cases where you proliferate or where you intend to proliferate. By the way, North Korea, to do what they, what they did, had to leave the NPT. There was no way they could do that, they could proliferate, because the NPT in its um, articulation, in the way it operates in conjunction with the safeguards system administered by the IAEA, makes it very difficult for you uh, to uh, stay uh, um, or to go unnoticed. Uh, of course, there are the cases of Iraq in the 1990s, we all know that, that brought about the additional protocol and the ameliorations uh, in the safeguards uh, system that, that we um, happily uh, have at the moment. But it, it is clear that the NPT, or being uh, in the NPT, uh, for those countries in good standing in the international community is an indispensable rule of uh, civility in international life. And let me, let me start, as one should always do, by citing my own example. Um, in my region, when we in Argentina, after the years of military dictatorship, with the return of democracy, we saw it clearly that uh, we could not sustain a nuclear program being outside the NPT. That, that was raising um, very, very troublesome questions about our intentions. And, and hence, we, uh, of course, there was a fascinating uh, process we, we had with our neighbors, with Brazil, that led to a joint system uh, which exists today of mutual inspections and of course all of that was done uh, under the aegis of the NPT. And I, I can say this because I, I remember growing up as a young diplomat, as a young diplomat with a completely different narrative that had it that the NPT was there as a conspiracy of, uh, you know, of the, of the haves against the, the have-nots, uh, which was fantasy and very negative uh, and, and, and uh, in a sense uh, the, the, the nuclear the civil nuclear program of Argentina thrived after joining all the nuclear regulation 
the nuclear norms, and Argentina is even in the south one of the uh, few exporters of nuclear technology. And this is precisely because we joined the NPT, we joined the expo control regimes. And coming back to India, I happened to preside for two successive terms over the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which is a group of countries, 48 countries, that harmonize, exchange views on their export policies, the controls they have. And one of the big uh, hot potatoes I had in front of me was the intense, intense desire of India and Pakistan to join the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which has as one of its conditions to be party to the NPT. And this, this was one of the reasons why the issue was, was, was not successful. But we, we discussed, and the, the issue is not over, completely over. But this to tell you the, the high uh, cost of entry that is, is put on you when you are not party to the NPT or the export control regimes uh, that exist. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry for this digression into a regional or a national thing, but I think it's a nice example of how the NPT actually works. Everything, everything we do, and this is the message I take when I go to developing countries, everything we do, and sometimes people don't realize this, everything they do in their small research reactor, in their nuclear medicine facility in North Africa or Southern Africa or Central America or Southeast Asia is possible because there is an NPT that allows for it. So the NPT is a service. It's not a big, solemn piece of international law that is out there or up there uh, in disconnect uh, with the day-to-day -day, uh, life, in particular in developing countries. So it does have this strategic aspect, which is so important, the Middle East, the disarmament, the pace of disarmament, the nuclear uh, weapons uh, and, and how to get rid of them. But it also has this other so fundamental uh, aspect. Hence, the necessity of having a successful um, outcome which will uh, protect the integrity uh, of a treaty that provides a very concrete uh, return, in my opinion. Ambassador, I, I see all that, but doesn't it come, doesn't it raise the danger of undermining the central proposition of the NPT, which is that it's legal for five nations to hold nuclear weapons, and it's illegal for people who are not the five nations, not the existing, to hold nuclear weapons. Uh, what you're talking about seems to be a sort of gray area between the two. That uh, there are certain things they can do and... Well, there is no gray area. I, I think the NPT, maybe, maybe this takes us b back in history, I think the NPT, and I'm talking in the, in the country of common sense, is common sense applied to international life. We, at a certain point, point in time, we came to the conclusion collectively as an international community that we had an issue there, that there were a group of countries having nuclear weapons, but there was an enormous risk of that uh, becoming a much, much bigger group. So something had to be done uh, about it. And on this, I think no one, I think almost no one, could argue that the NPT has not uh, been a success in containing the number of countries holding nuclear weapons to the number that uh, nine, more or less, that we have um, now. Uh, when you say, what about the others? Well, for the others, there is provision uh, in the treaty. There is provision. And then, of course, we get into the realm of the, of, of the discussion. Are we really doing all the necessary things to move to this world free of nuclear weapons, and that is a little bit on the eye of the beholder, the beholder nation. Uh, there's a sizable group of nations which consider that uh, enough has been done, and perhaps more 
uh, could be done. And there are others, and we know there are other instruments around now or in the future, that consider that more radical uh, measures should be adopted to, to get there uh, faster. Uh, Lord Jobley. Um, Ambassador, um, I wonder if you'd give us your thoughts on the relationship between the ban treaty and the NPT. And do you see uh, what might be perceived as a rivalry between the two um, affecting and causing problems uh, at the review conference in 2020? Thank you, uh, Lord Joplin. Uh, it, it's an excellent question because there's a big debate um, about this. Uh, quite clearly, um, the existence of a norm, uh, which is not yet in force, but might be in force by the time we, we get to the review conference, uh, we don't know, but um, dealing with, this, with the same uh, material subject, of course, raises questions. And, and this, uh, not only now, but even before, when, the, when this uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons was being negotiated, uh, this has a history, and I think you are aware of it, uh, but in the, in the decisions, in the resolution mandating this negotiation, it was specifically indicated that uh, this uh, treaty should not detract from and uh, complement or support, I don't know exactly the, the, the form of words they chose, but I think the intention was to say that there was not going to be any such thing. Granted, this is intention. Uh, the, uh, but then there is uh, the political position of, of some countries, and in the universe of those who were supporting the treaty, you, you will find different views. For some, it's uh, an, an additional norm that is, that is needed to get there faster. Uh, others may, may have a more, I would say, um, more dramatic view of things and may consider that this is uh, 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 the treaty of the day or the treaty of the time when the, when the, when the NPT is moving painfully at painfully slow uh, pace. What, what I can say in terms of the review conference is uh, I've been saying this and I will continue to say it uh, the review conference uh, sh should not be the place to discuss the merits or the um, drawbacks of uh, another instrument. Uh, it, is, it would be, I think, uh, a, a very um, frustrating and, and uh, divisive exercise if we went down that, that road. And I say it in my position as... as President designate to to both uh, sides of the debate, uh, to to those proponents of of the TPNW, I ask uh, to uh, not to bring uh, issues pertaining to this treaty to the review of the NPT, and to those who have been criticizing this ban treaty very harshly, uh, to also abstain from using uh, the platform of the NPT as uh, the place or the scenario for, uh, for this debate. I think uh, this treaty could become uh, detrimental if we allow this to happen, if we are determined and clear-sighted of what is our mission, which is to review uh, the NPT. Of course, I suppose those in favor of this treaty will take note of it, it, its existence. Others may have something to say, but one of my efforts as, as president will be to uh, make sure that this is not going to be a review or a debate about uh, the, the TPNW. Uh, I have a lot of respect for countries that have been um, pushing for, for, for that instrument, uh, but it's, um, uh, uh, like I say, it's a different treaty and uh, the NPT is, is uh, something else. So, uh, but it will take an effort on, on all those present and, and, uh, and working there to avoid, to prevent this kind of thing. And I believe, I humbly believe that it's in everybody's interest uh, 
uh, that this happens in, in this way. For the, for the T, P, and W believers, I think it would be important that they, do, they are not seen as uh, sabotaging the NPT. And for the others, uh, that, uh, for, the, for those who will criticize the T, P, and W, that they do not want to um, uncritically um, uh, destroy any disarmament initiative. So I think we all have a great interest in talking about the NPT and not about the T, P, and W. Well, Thank you. Well, Chairman, I just, forgive me for saying so, it sounds as if then that's, that's the NATO position that you're taking, because the NATO position quite clearly is that the ban treaty is contradictory to any way of making the NPT a success. That's what they've said to this uh, committee. And then, so I, 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 <coughs> and I just wonder if it's a, if it's a unhelpful position to make an, an artificial difference between the, how the states see the issue. Uh, your earliest remarks you mentioned about the Middle East yes. moving towards a uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone. In the latest P5 uh, chairman's report of the discussions of the P5 and the nuclear powers, they referenced the South uh, Asian weapons free zone and engaging in the discussions with yes. those. Yes. They, those countries are all signatories of the ban treaty. How can you make a distinction between the two when many of the states who are looking for progress see the deliberations in the ban treaty as one of the means of bringing about that progress? I think I'm just struggling to find how saying that they are separate instruments. If because they, they are. You know, this. Clearly, the countries are not separate countries that take a view of its position in the NPT and the ban treaty because they're signatories to both. Well, I don't know. F f first of all, I, you know, I, I don't think what I'm saying is the view of NATO. I, I won't speak for NATO countries, but I think NATO countries are more eloquent about what the, the, the ban treaty is or what the, the, the ban treaty does. Than, than what, I, what I've said. What, all, all, all I'm trying to say is that we uh, uh, need to uh, focus on the review of our treaty and the, the NPT, when it comes to disarmament, has an article, which is Article 6, that has a provision which is a um, forward-looking provision, as you remember it, um, which, of course, is different from what you have in the TPNW. It's a different proposition, the one that you have in the, in the Article 6. So my task is to review those words. Uh, it would be um, illogical to bring the logic of another treaty which goes for uh, immediate outright um, uh, prohibition of, uh, of the nuclear weapons, and I'm not criticizing this, I'm simply trying to be objective on what the basic aim and provision of the TPNW is. The NPT, as I said before, took a reality and, and formulated it uh, in a way that would allow us to operate together. Uh, so, uh, which is, I suppose, different from what you have uh, in the TPNW. TPNW, you, I mean, if you have weapons and you want to join the treaty, you have to get rid of your weapons, now or through a process. But you have to, get, you have to change your nature, you have to change your scheme. Uh, in the NPT, you don't need to do that. You are there and you commit yourself to do certain things. So in the end, the result would be the same. But it's a different, uh, it's a different way. I don't know if I'm making myself a little bit more clear, and perhaps. And I thank you for the opportunity. Barbara Smith. <coughs> thank you. Moving on um, to one of the issues that really the um, ban treaty is keen on, um, obviously nuclear disarmament, but the issue of verification of yeah. disarmament, where we've been told by various witnesses that there's been progress in disarmament. How far? Has that been the case? How far is it possible to verify it? And is that really leading us towards the meeting the commitments of Article 6 of the MPT? And is Article 6 actually under threat at the moment? 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Baroness. I think on nuclear verification, what we've been seeing is um, uh, a few interesting um, initiatives, one of which has had uh, the UK as one of the main participants, something called the uh, International Partnership on Nuclear Disarmament, IPNDV. Uh, Thank you very much. Dr. Williams is helping me. Um, so, uh, and Argentina is part of that as well. So, um, I think this 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 is interesting because um, uh, apart from the from the grandiosity of uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons, there is the technical work, which is awfully complicated because of everything which is um, which is involved in the uh, in the process. And I think exercises like the IPNDV have been very interesting in trying to bring together, because when you get, when we eventually get into the process of, the, of verifying nuclear disarmament, you will have to do it in a, in a wider or through a wider circle of inspectors. Uh, I've seen this firsthand in my days as a um, chemical weapon uh, disarmer. Uh, so you have inspectors there working on chemical weapons which, you know, are not do not come from countries that do have the expertise or were ever producing uh, chemical weapons. Uh, so for, for nuclear weapons it's even more complicated, much more complicated, although um, chemical disarmament is in itself very tricky. But um, I think that the good thing about this effort is that it's preparing the ground for when one gets to that point. And, um, and I think it's, this has been very positive because we, I, I could cite an analogy with the example of the nuclear test ban uh, treaty. For many, many years, I used to be a delegate in Geneva, where there was not even the negotiation of a comprehensive test ban treaty. And we used to have, those days in Geneva, uh, a group of scientific experts which was meeting regularly in Geneva, um, looking into you know the seismic technologies and other technologies that are now um, you know brought into bear through the CTBTO and the system that it has brought um, about. Um, and I remember those days; some people were a bit you know cynical about the effort and the fact that we had a very nice group of scientists meeting in one room. Um, in Geneva, well, while there was not even the negotiation uh, of a treaty on that. So uh, I believe, I, I think it's true when people say that there has been progress in tackling or starting to tackle the technical issues, the methods, the sequences, the technologies, the non-proliferation barriers that you have to set up for having a, a, a truly multinational uh, inspectorate dealing with nuclear um, verif disarmament verification. Uh, but of course, that is what it is. That does, doesn't necessarily mean that you are really moving forward with actual disarmament. But I would not discount it. I would not discard this at all. I think it's very useful. The exercise, in fact, is continuing. I think we are on phase two of the of the IPNDV, and I hope to see this uh, continue. So um, uh, I think your question has also the interesting side of allowing me to say that all, in, in all these things, one has always to be very humble and work on every, you know, it's like a parallel chess um, uh, games. I mean, you have to be active on all these different uh, tables to be, to be efficient at the, at the international law one, at the technical uh, part, because um, political circumstances change. And when political circumstances change, uh, those better uh, catch us ready. Um, uh, Lord, Lord Hannah. Yes, I wonder if we could uh, just have a look at the International Atomic Energy Agency, in which you played a distinguished role, I think, um, in recent years. Uh, a couple of questions about it. 
Um, do you think that it's adequately resourced for the uh, tasks that are put upon it or might be put upon it in the future? Uh, and do you think uh, that the additional protocol, which after all was developed because the previous safeguard regime had proved itself to be inadequate, yes. uh, is now a genuine gold standard which should give assurance that no untoward activities are taking place <coughs> in countries which have agreed to have signed up to the additional protocol. Uh, I wonder if you could just answer those two questions. Thank you for those uh, questions, uh, Lord Hanny. Uh, they are very relevant. The, uh, qu quite clearly, the IAA play, plays an indisputable and dispensable uh, role uh, in, in, in all of this. I think in terms of resources and having had, having had the privilege of serving at two, at, at the two um, uh, international agencies uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, weapons of mass destruction in force, the OPCW in The Hague first and then the IAEA, there is also um, a little bit of this tendency, and you as uh, uh, former ambassador, you know it, there is this tendency from sometimes from secretariats to push for resources, for more resources. Uh, I think this cuts both ways. In, in, in a certain sense, it is true that uh, the, when it comes to the IAEA, for example, that when you do a, a very simple accountant's analysis of the uh, number of uh, facilities uh, and locations outside facilities uh, that do come under inspection, when you look into the amount, the quant quantitative amount of nuclear material that comes under safeguards, you will see an increase. Uh, so would that mean that we, we need uh, uh, an uh, unstoppable uh, degree of resources being, uh, being allocated to the IAA uh, lest we, we, uh, we defund it? I think it depends. When, when it comes to, I think it's reasonably resourced. I think uh, the GCPOA, uh, for example, has brought a very uh, um, difficult challenge in terms of additional burden of work and money that the agency has had to solve by the or through the unorthodox um, uh, means of uh, extra budgetary and voluntary contributions, which is not very healthy because verification should be on the basis of a regular budget. But that is, that is true. I think this has more to do with the way in which safeguards will be conducted in the future. I think, and I, I know that you've been looking into certain aspects of new technologies, cyber and other things in your, in your deliberations, which, is very, which are very relevant. I think we are moving into a, a world where verification uh, and, and, and techniques for safeguards should also become more efficient. Uh, I think, uh, of course, member states, and in particular, uh, those uh, having nuclear weapons uh, should uh, make sure that they keep uh, the agency and every institution dealing with non-proliferation adequately resourced. But it's, it's a two-way street. I think we should look into more efficient ways. And uh, the additional protocol, which you mentioned, is of course a way to look into this in a more efficient uh, way. Once you are getting into integrated safeguards, one once you get into what is called in the jargon the broader conclusion where you feel that a country is uh, by and large and by the amount of uh, inspection work you do is, 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 is in good compliance perhaps you can start moderating the inspection effort in those countries and, and, and you can share your resources uh, more efficiently. Quite clearly and contrary to what one may have thought after Fukushima Nuclear energy continues to be an important factor in the energy matrix of many, many countries, in particular big emerging um, economies like China, constructing at the moment 18 new reactors, India, I mean, you name it, Russia. So it's not going to be away anytime soon. So we will need to be watching uh, that, how we conduct 
safeguards. And of course, it, it is not a matter of putting more and more and more money because uh, it's not sustainable as a business model. Uh, but uh, also integrating new technology and, of course, getting to the best standards of uh, verification through the Edition Program. Thank you. Now, uh, our final question, our final discussion, um, Baroness Anne. Ambassador, um, thank you for being here today. And earlier on, you referred in your answer to a question about the ban treaty to some of the work you hope to do as uh, now the president designate, designate of Revcon. Uh, in particular, you said that you'll be asking those who are for and against the ban treaty to abstain from using Revcon as a platform for further expanding discussion on that. So in advance of the Revcon, what, would, um, what could the nuclear weapons states do to help you uh, by building bridges with the non-nuclear weapons states? What kind of activity do you think would assist the ability of both sides at the REVCON to avoid using it for that platform? Well, th thank you for that, that question, Baroness. Um, I think they can do a lot. Uh, the, the, the P5, uh, of course, are the countries that are recognized by the, by the NPT as the countries uh, that uh, do, do have uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and in that group, you have uh, no less than three, the, the three depositories of the NPT. Being a depository, for anyone uh, familiar with international law, brings a moral responsibility uh, towards the, the, the aims and the objectives of, of, of the treaty. So um, I uh, intend to uh, consult uh, with, with, with the P5 uh, as frequently uh, and as intensely as I can. Uh, I know that the, the, uh, the coordination of the NPT efforts of the P5 revert to the United Kingdom for this year. So uh, I hope that I'll be able to, to interact with, with my colleagues at the Foreign Office, uh, seeing uh, how they can help me. And <coughs> while uh, it could be perhaps difficult for me to say in which concrete ways, I think uh, they uh, need to uh, uh, show uh, engagement with the President, because I will be bringing to them uh, in the, in the run-up to the conference and during the conference the sentiment of the many and uh, trying to see and work with them in ways that will, as I said in the beginning, preserve the integrity uh, and the usefulness of the treaty for us all. Otherwise, there's no sense in, in, in having uh, all this effort. So I think they have a, a great responsibility in staying engaged, uh, showing unity of purpose, uh, and being prepared to listen. Uh, so, as I said, uh, I will try to, as, as a president, as a good president should be, to, ask, to act as an active, honest broker uh, and work as closely as I can uh, with them. And as I said, there is the happy coincidence of, of uh, being uh, London, the place where this coordination is going to be taking place for the remainder of the time after the next uh, PrepCom in New York until the conference proper uh, in 2020. So I hope to be able to... Uh, to come and, uh, and tell you how, how good I'm doing, if, if I can. Thank you very much. Dr. Ambassador Grossi, your um, views have been immensely valuable to us. And I think we're all quite struck by your reminder that these sort of reviews can't take place in a vacuum and that this time round it's a very different world from last time. It is. It's a vast expansion of China, a very different America, different policy from there. And um, I was thinking by, by now, many, some idealists, I think including me, thought that Russia would be a member of NATO and a happy democracy, which of course is very far from being. Um, so, as you say, the outside world determines how you're going to get on. But what you have to tell us is positive and focused and valuable to us, and we're very grateful to you. Well, thank, I, you, so thank you very much. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to talk uh, to all of you about this. Uh, as you can see, I, I don't have any magic wand, uh, but I do have a clear determination. I know where I want to go, and this is a successful outcome uh, for the review of a treaty. And as the Latins used to say, there are no good wins for those who do not know where they want to go. And I know where I want to go. 
So I help you. I thank you for helping me doing that, and I hope to see more of you in the next few months. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Spend it. Mr. Kunders, or Minister Kunders, good morning. Now, we're very pleased that you've been able to join us today, and we're much looking forward to hearing your views on issues in which you've been a, a central player, uh, and no doubt will be continue to be so, um, in particular in relation, as you've heard from the previous evidence, to uh, the future Revcon Treaty, but much more to the general ambience in which nuclear uh, disarmament negotiations and indeed arms control generally are proceeding in an extremely disturbed world uh, and we would greatly value your overview of um, what lies ahead. Uh, I should just remind you formally that this is a televised session. There's a transcript and if you need to alter it afterwards if it doesn't reflect what you've said then you can do that. I remind my colleagues also to declare any interests when they talk. So. May we begin with a, a fairly general question. Um, where are we on the risk of nuclear weapons use? We've heard about the suggestion that there's a blurring between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons in the minds of the Russians. Uh, we've heard about, we've seen about the INF Treaty being undone on both sides. We've seen about uh, the uh, proliferation, the multipolarity issues. Give, would you give us, in your experience, and from your national, uh, important national role as well as Minister of Foreign Affairs of your country, your assessment of, of the rather gloomy statement, we're in for a new arms race. Are we ready? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me first say that it's a great honour and pleasure to be here with you uh, in the House of Lords and uh, to give evidence on what I think has again become one of the most uh, pressing issues for all of us which is how we proceed uh, with supporting, sustaining and strengthening the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the conference that takes uh, place next year. I still think it's the hallmark international treaty that we have on security. And this bargain between the haves and the have-nots and the way that uh, impinges on our world and the insecurities that you were mentioning. Uh, and the future of uh, this, this still idea we all have uh, of, of a ground zero or a global zero. Uh, and nuclear disarmament. Um, I think, and I just sensed that when, when I came in the room, you were talking about the Cold War. I think this whole issue comes back a little bit with a vengeance uh, to uh, all of us. And I sensed that very much in the time that I was also Minister of Foreign Affairs for, for the Netherlands. Uh, I mean, the actuality is clear. We every day deal with this issue right now. If it's the GCPOA, uh, I just came back yesterday in a meeting with Chinese, Russians, Americans and, and Europeans on the tension around Iran and the need to get at least some element of uh, consensus building around us. And you know this is very difficult. We have a problem not only of unpredictable but uh, unpredictability, but of revisionist powers. I would to a certain extent say also big man politics, which makes it, makes it more difficult to support and sustain negotiations. We see that today in North Korea, where I hope that the diplomacy, which is very necessary, and the end of testing that we have seen is now also accompanied by something which was referred to, I think, in your earlier session, the importance of the, the, the global situation and the regional uh, Asian situation combined with verification. And we see it, uh, and I would like to talk maybe in answering to your questions, I have quite a few introductory remarks, but I think it's better to go into your questions as well, on the INF Treaty, which in my view has not received sufficient attention of our political leadership uh, in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. It, it gives uh, the, the political atmosphere a little bit like, well, this is going to be a lost treaty. And if we look all this in the context of, of nuclear uh, proliferation, uh, of course, a lot of things will have to happen after we saw the failure of the, non, uh, of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 2015. I've been there in 2005, 2010, and 2015, and you see clearly that this is getting increasingly difficult uh, to move to consensus, to have this important role of discussion between the nuclear states and the non-nuclear states. Uh, I know you, you, you will have some questions to me on, on the nuclear uh, test ban, where we as of the nuclear ban uh, treaty, 
where my country is only NATO member actually was engaging in the talks, although we voted against uh, the final uh, uh, treaty. But I think it exemplifies uh, two things. One is the enormous changes that we see in technology and the way the world is organized. And secondly, the lack of political action to deal with this. Now, I think you have mentioned already, uh, not, we have now not only bipolar, but multipolar centers of gravity, uh, China, India, North Korea, Pakistan, uh, including uh, the, up, you know, the update of, of delivery systems. Secondly, we have uh, the big risk of the nuclear threshold. I'm very worried about that. You see at the moment this dangerous entanglement of nuclear and non-nuclear systems including uh, this uh, great risk of conventional prompt global strikes, at least the perception of countries that these things uh, might actually lead to, to uh, the possibility of uh, prompt global strikes, which increases the insecurities of actually all powers in different ways. I would like to underline also from, let's say, that more technical point, the increasing risks of uh, cyber weapons. I think they have an untested uh, potential to corrupt a state's early warning and command systems, including rising ri risks to nuclear weapons. So if you want to set priorities, that is one of the first I would, I would look at. Um, I'm sure that your committee has looked also to the risk of shortened warning times because of uh, the location of uh, nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles or the modernization close to the territory of somebody else. And therefore, this whole issue of communication, communication channels, becomes increasingly important. If I would two priorities for the immediate uh, future, I would say this need for a communication channel uh, uh, between, uh, first of all, uh, of course, uh, the NATO allies and Russia. I know how difficult that is, but we've done it in the Cold War. I see actually the, 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 the closeness around the people in, 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 in Russia makes it more difficult to have communication, but we need more than we have right now. Uh, and this is, uh, the, the risk of miscalculation is high. We talk about that for a long time, uh, but this goes much further, further than, say, a de-escalation regime that we've seen in Syria, which was useful, but nevertheless uh, was, was, was not sufficient. Uh, so I think that that is important as well. Well, on, on the political setting, I think I wouldn't take too much time because we can talk about that for a long time, but I see an erosion of the arms control regimes, not only the INF, the risks to start, and the proper preparation of the, of the, of the non-proliferation uh, treaty review conference next uh, year. We can talk about that in answering your, your questions. I still think there are some possibilities to, to work on the INF. I'm not overly optimistic, but I think it should be an urgency, because if we don't do that, I see again a risk of division in Europe, uh, a risk of division between Europe and the United States and a lack of any competence uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and force in our multilateral negotiations uh, on this. Uh, and my last plea would be, because that's why I'm so happy that I'm here, I'm coming from, of course, a much smaller nation, a nation that has the umbrella of nuclear weapons. Uh, we have still one task, nuclear task, which is uh, depending on the United States with the uh, the bombs that we have in our, our, our planes, whether there is an issue of should they be modernized or not. Um, but I think at this uh, stage, I think it's important that we get much more discussion, not only among the P5, which is very difficult, and you are one of the crucial elements there. You are a crucial transatlantic link. In my view, Brexit or not, a key uh, element in the cooperation in Europe on security. And this I would really call for, I think it was mentioned by the ambassador as well, the fact that I was willing to engage against a lot of opposition from all my NATO partners, not to engage in the nuclear ban talks. You can, you, can, you can have big questions about the outcome. We voted against this. But I think this dialogue in terms of transparency, regional discussions, is not something we can easily think that that goes away. It's crucial for the success next year in the review uh, conference. And, there's much more to be said about all this, but I'm happy to try to answer your questions if I, if I can. Well, thank, thank you. A whole lot of issues and fascinating thoughts there. Baroness Cousins once. Thank you. Um, how would you uh, assess the relative risks um, of nuclear use that have been f 
flag the various different risks that have been flagged up to us um, as between mistaken use, accidental use, and rogue use by non-state actors, for example, um, and indeed any other nuclear use that is not legitimate and intentional. And are there different sorts of actions and systems that need to be put in place to try and improve the security for each type of risk? I think we have made some progress uh, in the area of the risks of the use of nuclear material by non-state actors. I think at least there is a large degree of consensus in the world on this, but we have to stop that. Of course, there are rogue nations, there are issues that make this still a priority. But I think one of the few areas in which we can continue to reinforce multilateral cooperation is in this nuclear security initiative, which was started at the time by President uh, uh, Obama, and which has been continued. Now, I'm not saying this is the, there is not a risk. The risk is still there. And this has a lot to do with cooperation between our intelligence services, uh, which has to be very precise. Of course, there are risks of certain countries exporting possibly material to other nations. Uh, but I think in the context of what we have as a framework, we have to continue to work hard on this. Now, on the issue of the use of nuclear weapons, the misuse of nuclear weapons, uh, authorized, unauthorized, I, I think we all realize there are different forms of this. My biggest worry is by far miscalculation, uh, short warning times. Um, the issue of the blurring between nuclear and non-nuclear weapons, and which is, I think, very key, maybe also to discuss by the UK government in the context of modernization of nuclear weapons, whatever your opinion might be around this, I'm worried by the increased use of, uh, of the use or the mentioning of the use or the sable rattling around the use of nuclear weapons in defense strategies. Uh, we've seen that in the Russian Federation especially. They have some of the policies that I'm very critical about. You know, their conventional nuclear balance might be such that they at least hint towards the early use of nuclear weapons to stop a, a, a possible conflict at an early stage. I think that threshold, if that is gone, we have a major issue. And therefore, the, the discussion in NATO, both on nuclear threshold, which wasn't so very much discussed, frankly, in the discussions that I have seen, at least not sufficiently so. Uh, and secondly, the issue of uh, the nuclear threshold as to the use of nuclear weapons in strategy should be, in my view, the, the first priority in that context of our own responsibilities at NATO, as, as, as NATO allies, where we look very critical at, of course, at other players. Uh, and I think the Russian Federation is one of the biggest uh, uh, concerns uh, there. So it's miscalculation. Uh, it is uh, early warning times where we need the communication uh, channels. Again, there, it's difficult to see how that couldn't work. We, we have been working in the European Leadership Network where uh, your colleague Des Brown is active, Americans are, are active, Russians are active. We haven't come very far yet. If I look also to, and let me take just the European context for a second, and that is complex because the real question is now how do we deal with multilateral issues, with the Chinese and the Indians and the Pakistani and so on. Uh, but I would think also uh, your committee might look at what you think of the NATO-Russia Council to what extent that could be beefed up, what the position is of your government in this. I've been very critical of, of the Russian Federation. As you are here, we are close allies, and what we see is a very disturbing behavior of the Russian Federation in uh, their defense postures, in the sable rattling around the use of nuclear weapons about exercises, uh, especially about Ukraine. But my feeling has always been, in the, in the history of our alliance, the Harmel Doctrine, we can only have deterrence if we have also dialogue, even if it's difficult, that we have to raise this up above ambassadorial level, above some of the military uh, exchanges that we have right now. I think this, this is uh, very important. I know it's difficult, but this would be another priority I would mention. In short, your answering is I'm not thinking that there will be immediately a use of nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, there's still a, a deterrent nature to, the, to, to nuclear weapons. We saw today and I hope that works, but the risks are high between India and Pakistan, at least the Pakistani 
uh, Prime Minister said, okay, we have to sit down. Uh, there is some deterrent effect, but at the same time, in a time of uh, neo-nationalism, big man politics and technology, I think some of these elements of communication channels, of uh, understanding that in a dangerous world is especially the time you need to talk, is, is, is crucial. And we did it in the Cold War. Uh, we had many more contacts, and we always made the link between strategic stability and arms control. Uh, the one might actually be a precondition for the other. You cannot have strategic stability if you don't talk, because the insecurity becomes so high around some of the uh, technological developments that I, I just mentioned. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Lord Hannay, would you also like to go on with your next question as well? Uh, okay, but I, yes, could I just start? Uh, yeah. First of all, I should declare an interest as a member of the European Leadership Network, uh, to which you referred, um, and uh, just pick up, if I could, a couple of references you made to uh, discussions with the Russians and the lack of them, and how this was very undesirable, a view that was, I think, shared by this committee in the last report we did about shifting power relationships in which we suggested that in the area that we're talking about today, arms control and nuclear weapons, it really was important to talk to the Russians. But I wonder if you could just, as a former foreign minister, tell us how on earth we managed to achieve that without it looking like business as usual, which I think we're all very determined should not be the case uh, so long as the Russians are doing what they're doing in Ukraine and Crimea. So going on from that, and quite separately from that, the US administration has at least two of its policy initiatives in recent uh, time uh, have cut across the views of their main European partners, including the United Kingdom. The first of these, of course, is the Iran deal the JCPOA when they pulled out, and the second is their decision to withdraw from the uh, INF, which you referred to. Uh, on the JCPOA, uh, do you think that the European uh, policy of trying to sustain that agreement uh, is the right one? Are we doing everything that we can or should be doing to do that if it is the right one? Uh, and on the, international, uh, the INF, I wonder if you could uh, just sort of suggest some ways in which the Europeans should enter into the debate now. What should we be trying to achieve in it? Uh, is the INF as such, the treaty, savable at all? If it's not, uh, what sort of arrangements dealing with intermediate range weapons in Europe uh, could be uh, an objective for Europeans? Uh, can it, is it possible to think of a regional approach to this? Is it possible to avoid any new deployment of intermediate weapons on either side in Europe without the treaty? Perhaps you could just speculate a little bit on that. Thank you very much. And I appreciate very much your, your, your questions and, and also the last uh, element because in a, in a world of big unpredictability there is a lot of speculation as well. So I take my answers for, for, for what they are worth. The first question is uh, a very important one. Uh, I have been foreign minister till the end of 2017. I cannot, I wasn't part of all the NATO meetings in 2018. I followed them, of course, uh, carefully. My, what struck me in the period that I was foreign minister is actually that NATO stayed very unified on Russia. Sometimes it was criticized, we would divide ourselves. It's not only on the sanctions issue, which is more on the European and transatlantic issue, but nevertheless on the basic issue of the need to answer conventionally in terms of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, the enhanced uh, 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 activities in the Baltic states, uh, the issue of strengthening deterrence and so on and so forth. I was struck that we were more unified than we, than sometimes it was said from the outside. There was a strong need to, to answer appropriately in a way would, that wouldn't make us sleepwalk into a conflict, but to answer on the strengths that we have as NATO in cooperation 
including on Article 5. Now, I leave all the discussions on what we do on cybersecurity in Article 5, how that actually works out exactly for the Baltic states and so on. But, but I think that's point number one. The second is also that in all the meetings uh, that we've had, Ukraine was always the first point, and correctly so, because the, the rules of the, games were, of the game were uh, violated in very strong uh, ways by, uh, by the Russian Federation, and every day you see that it's in this country, uh, with Skipal and all kinds of other activities. We need to be extremely vigilant in many areas, including hybrid warfare. The question remains a little bit how we deal then with the dialogue aspect. When is something becoming business as usual? This was a debate in the NATO Council every time. And I think we got a bit stuck there because the majority of countries said, yes, we will continue that military political policy that I just put the main uh, emphasis on. But we need to talk about these things we just mentioned. We cannot simply not talk to the Russians on issues that are in our interest, like we do on anti-terrorism, uh, like uh, at a certain military way, we, not NATO, but the US did on the escalation in Syria and so on and so forth. So let us, uh, and that was my position, uh, and I think of, of, of some important allies as well, business as usual is also a little bit how you define it. It's also in your own self-interest to keep talking about especially the big exercises that the Russian Federation was doing, the inspections, the risk of mass calculation in the air, and so on and so forth. So that shouldn't inhibit us, and I don't think it's then automatically business as usual, uh, to, to in improve and increase those communication channels. I think we failed so far, frankly, to be very honest. I don't think there is much, uh, except for a few meetings at ambassadorial level, there has been, uh, I think, some talks between uh, Gerasimov and Sakur, but looking at the technological and political changes that we were talking about, I think simply it's not uh, sufficient and it's not enough. And it's not only, by the way, NATO to blame, it's also very difficult on the other side, and I mentioned something about the close nature on all these issues uh, uh, at the moment. But I think we have to pursue that in the interest of security in Europe and the Harmel doctrine, if I may say so. The second question you had was, was of course, on GCPOA. Look, I'm, uh, 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 I think it's important to say, because we, we are in a time of extreme polarization around the issue of Iran in the world. And the polarization is understandable, looking at the activities of Iran on ballistic missiles, uh, on human rights, on their activities, especially in Syria, uh, but also in Iraq. I think the GCPOA has taught us that sometimes, it's again a little bit business as usual or not, we live in a time that you have to cooperate also with countries that you're in conflict with. And you have to delineate where you cooperate on and how and when uh, and where uh, you remain in, in a substantial conflict. That's a, that's a way. The US uh, new administration has, in my view, taken a very wrong decision on this. I think it was important to isolate the issue of the nuclear, uh, the nuclear issue. Uh, I know that even after this has happened, uh, you know, there have been negotiations uh, to try at least to involve maybe also some of these other issues after GCPOA, but again, the American administration was not willing to engage in this. So I'm a defender of the GCPOA. I think uh, if it will remain or not, is an enormous battleground at the moment, which plays out both in Iran, if you see this whole issue around uh, the, the, the position of the foreign minister, who is, is the, sort of the icon of this agreement, and how it can get and keep support between hard and, and soft lines, if you wish, in Iran. And of course, in Europe and, and the United States. I think the vehicle that we have is, is, of course, weak. Most of the countries do not invest a whole lot in Iran right now. We have the use of the, 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 the dollar, obviously, that plays a role in this. But I think we still have to diplomatically and where we can economically beef up uh, this vehicle. Because I think it would be an other, an other undermining of a multilateral treaty you cannot just simply say from one day to the other, even if you are a subsequent uh, um, administration, to, to just give that up. I think it's risky, and it's a signal also, by the way, if you want to get agreement with other countries, including North Korea, which already has, to a certain extent, and is much further in, in, in the nuclear weapon uh, issue. The INF is the most difficult uh, uh, question by far. 
look, frankly, the future looks grim. I, I, I agree with, uh, uh, you didn't say that, but I think, frankly, that is the case. My feeling is, feeling not more than that, that Washington seems uninterested in preserving the treaty. I think the same might be true to a certain extent also in the Russian Federation. It might give both sides a certain free hand in view of some of the other challenges that they see in the world, including in China. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, there is a serious risk to this INF treaty. I think uh, uh, that, that it's a two-track approach for, for what it's worth, uh, for two reasons, not only because of the need of our nuclear security and European security, but also to ensure that Europe is not again caught in the middle in the transatlantic relation or inter-European divisions, which we see already on this. My country was, I mean, we had the biggest crisis in the 70s on the, you know, on the, the, the nuclear missile crisis when, they, when, when uh, there was the issue of the, the, the Pershings and the, uh, and the SS-20, which led in the end to the INF Treaty. Uh, and, and I'm sure that in Europe there will be enormous divisions about mirroring and installing ground-based uh, nuclear weapons in Europe. So what to do about this? Look, first on what we still could do in the present INF Treaty, of which I'm a bit skeptical, but uh, I think we have, as NATO said, that these 9M729 missiles of the, the, the Russians uh, are a concern which requires verification and inspection. I do think, and I would think it would be wise if it's going to happen or not, I don't know, that it would be good if also the Pentagon would want to explore to... Uh, see to some of Russia's concerns on the so-called Aegis Ashore missile defense system, which is placed in Romania, and which is by them perceived, rightly or wrongly, I leave that for what it is, as a possibility also for short uh, range or middle range uh, ballistic missiles for Russia. So there is a sense used or not used of the need uh, for transparency and maybe verification. Uh, in, in any case, these two elements could lead to options where both sides ensure compliance via mutual inspections. Again, I'm not overly optimistic on this, uh, but this is one way at least we should pursue and haven't pursued right now. It is as if INF has been given up and nobody is doing much for reasons of transatlantic relations, for reasons of the wider world. I think that is a signal if the demise of the INF uh, treaty is simply said it is unavoidable. I wouldn't know really why, actually. Then the second uh, possibilities then, well, if it doesn't work, uh, what could you do uh, then? Uh, and and may, may I make, sorry, may I come back to the, the, the first element uh, before I come to the second one? I was talking about the 80s. What happened in the 80s which is different from now and why we could get to the INF? First, there was consultation transatlantically. And the European countries set up the high-level group, which was about the nature of deterrence and strategic stability. So when the SS-20s were there, what is the gap for us? What's the risk to our security? Should it be filled? Is it decoupling us from the United States? Or is it actually coupling us with the United States? That was the, the discussion about the figures. If you had too many, the idea was the Americans could limit a nuclear war to Europe. If you had not enough, maybe the Americans wouldn't fight for Europe. That was a little bit of debate at that time. And so what the NATO did was setting up, under the pressure of the Europeans, two things, a high-level group to discuss exactly this issue. To what extent are these ballistic missiles, if they are there and it's verified on the Russian side, a risk to us? Do we, have the, do we need new answers or do we have sufficient answers every, uh, right now in the other redundancy of nuclear weapons that we have? Or would it require a certain answer? And is that necessary something on the ground, which looks not very likely? I think that was a very key element in the discussion. Strategic stability and then, at the same time, uh, a group of experts who were working in parallel on arms control. If we look at the answer, which is not so clear, that we should answer in a certain way or the other, as we should definitely, in my view, not mirror what the Russians are doing as a sort of a new somewhat ignorant logic in my view, 
but look at the arms control side on the other side. That's what NATO did in the, in the 1980s, and in the end, under the leadership of uh, President Reagan, unexpectedly, it led to the INF Treaty. Interesting, because the SS-20 were actually seen as targeted on Europe as well, but we were in favor of a zero option. And those other nuclear weapons, of course, could still also be targeted at Europe. So I would plead for that in that first instance. I'm not sure if it will happen, frankly, in view of the transatlantic relation, but, but let's be all politicians. Nothing is preordained. Uh, and, and, and the passivity around this is, is in, my, uh, in my view, a little bit worrisome. Now, then, if that doesn't work, which is not unlikely because of the willingness, maybe, on some sites to continue and see this as part of nuclear modernization processes and nuclear posture, posture revisions. Then there are two possibilities. The Germans have looked at, and I, I think they have been the most opposed to an answer on the ground, if there would be, have to be given an answer to these uh, 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 threats from the Russian Federation, if they are verified, it would be to say maybe we can again do either a, a, a prohibition of uh, sub-strategic weapons in Europe, sort of uh, INF2, I guess, but it's not so clarified by the Germans. They also have been relatively silent on this because their coalition, I don't know, again, this is not for uh, uh, proof, but might be divided on this. Uh, the second is, uh, if, uh, if, if you don't do that, you could talk about geographic limitations. I think the foreign minister of Germany has spoken about that. I have some doubts about that because I think technically that's not so easy. Uh, you know, these systems are mobile, so you can place them for the other thing on the board. So then the other, the other big challenge is, and that's the biggest one, is to multilateralize this. I think that's the biggest challenge we have. Because whatever we say about emerging technologies, the risks for the use of nuclear weapons, the risk reduction we need, uh, the, the way we have to also show to the non-nuclear states that we are serious about all this if we want to succeed next year. Uh, having said all this, then the alternative is to do what we have to do in many policy areas, namely a world which is uh, one of shifting power, different complex interests, and multilateralize the issue of ballistic missiles. That requires, I think, not something we can do uh, in the short term as sort of a solution to the INF uh, treaty, but I think, again, there the role of the P5 is absolutely crucial. I know there are differences. I know there is also the, the, the whole game now, the United States, China, we'll see how that works out. Also, Russia feels vulnerable to it. I know that when you involve China, if they would be willing to do this, you had immediately the issue of, of Pakistan, India. You can make it as complex as you wish. But my view is, without any naivete, that this is the way to go, and in which maybe the United Kingdom, as one of the P5, could play a role or develop ideas. Uh, because uh, otherwise, we, we basically let it go. And I'm not convinced that if INF goes, START goes as well, but it's definitely not unlikely. And then we have some risks for the erosion, uh, further erosion of the uh, uh, nuclear non-proliferation uh, regimes as well. And I think uh, we have to be very careful uh, about that in view of the world we're living in. No, yes. uh, your, your reference, which I listened to with, with interest to the, the differences between now and the 1980s, um, which understandably in the context of you answering the question was uh, the different perspective from the Western point of view, really, the, the, the uh, closer uh, attachment between North America and, and Europe at that, at that time. But surely isn't it very important to look at the colossal difference from the uh, perspective of someone sitting in, in Moscow? I mean, uh, the change was so spectacular that uh, to anyone of my generation, at any rate, brought up in the coldest period of the, of the Cold War, um, that suddenly um, the, uh, uh, the, the Warsaw Pact dissolved um, and NATO moved spectacularly uh, to the east. And uh, I can barely believe it even now when I'm saying it, that, that Albania is a member of NATO. I mean, if you'd have said that was a possibility 20-odd uh, years ago, you, you would have been, uh, people with white coats would have come in and checked you. And, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what's happened. And surely that colossal change, which we've almost um, uh, absorbed as being the new norm, is, is a change which, if we don't understand that change from the Russian perspective, then, to me, we haven't got past first base. The extent to which we're 
accommodate their anxieties um, is a matter of debate. But the fact that the anxieties exist is surely utterly understandable. Um, I agree with that. I think the, the, uh, and, and you're right. I made just the, a connection with the 80s as a way within the transatlantic alliance to look at how we can actually look at answers that are not simply mirroring what we think the Russians are doing, but to see to what extent we can link that to sensible common security for both sides, strategic stability, something on both sides. And I'm even hesitant to use the word, maybe for reasons that you are referring to as well. I still think we're not back in a Cold War. I think we could, shouldn't go back at that logic as well. And I, uh, as I said, I think also on the nuclear posture that I've seen the modernization plans in, 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 in the US uh, and the enormous push that I have sensed also in NATO just to mirror automatically what the Russians presumably are doing is, in my, in my view, a mistake. That's why I'm in favor of these communications and understanding also from what the Russian side is coming. That's why I think we have to de-link some of the, uh, 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 the policies and the, and the problems we have with the Russian Federation on the Ukraine, on hybrid warfare, from this issue. Now, on NATO enlargement, uh, and uh, to understand where Russia is coming from is, is, in my view, an eternal debate. And I'm sure there are different positions that you have here as well. I always believe that you have to understand in a nuclear age where never a nuclear war can be fought and shouldn't be fought. We know that. We have to understand where the other side comes from and what their politics is. We have to be vigilant. This is a hard world these days. The Russian Federation is so willing to, to uh, yeah, for reasons of its conventional forces, to look at the early use at nuclear weapons. It's saying that openly. We cannot just deny that and, and stay where we were. I feel that NATO enlargement has been a free choice of countries that have been democratically uh, chosen for this. That doesn't take away that I understand very well the psychology of this. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, we live in a world that we have to work, and that's why I'm, I'm also a proponent that the United Kingdom and Russia and the others are also in the P5 looking at their responsibilities on this. Uh, Lord Purvis, other treaties. Yeah, uh, Lord Chairman, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to return to the point you made before with regards to the position of the Netherlands and in the relation to the Ban Treaty. You mentioned that even entering into the, the early stages of the discussions and negotiations of that uh, met with a response from other NATO members, which I was interested in your comment on that. Uh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that there was a, a clear stance in the the Parliament of the Netherlands that the government would enter into the negotiations first, but then it was clear in reading the explanation of the vote that because the because of the text of the of the treaty would be contrary to the NATO membership, you had a clear stance that you could not support it. But why did you why did the Netherlands vote against rather than abstain like the other NATO members? And there was another comment in the explanation of vote which I was interested in and I can quote from it saying that we, we plan to explore how we can restore a shared sense of purpose to the disarmament and non-proliferation regime and secondly which I thought very interesting we would have liked to see more ambition reflected in its provisions yeah. um, so I wondered if you could maybe explain what, what level ambition could have been in the provisions but clearly not contrary to the provisions of the NATO membership. Where, where, is, where would that ground be that, you, that the Netherlands would have been satisfied with? Look, to be very honest with you, sir, um, this has not been an easy position that I've taken in this debate on the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, it's been criticised left and right, and I still am convinced we did the right thing. The Netherlands has always been, uh, of course, a member of NATO. Uh, we're part of the umbrella. Uh, but historically, and also in my own political life, I have felt that the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as I said, is the hallmark treaty that we have. And that although we have made major progress in the reduction of nuclear weapons to 15,000, it's still enormous. And uh, the non-nuclear states have not been taken very seriously by the nuclear states, in no form whatsoever. We still are happy and it's still too many that we only have nine 
countries with nuclear weapons. Could have been much more. Libya, Kazakhstan, South Africa. You know, this is an important treaty. And so my government has always been to go to the limit with countries who have no nuclear weapons and have very fair points. In 2005, I was in this meeting in New York, it was disastrous for the Non-Proliferation Review Conference. 2010, we agreed with 13 points of implementation and not much happened. Frankly, the responsibility of the nuclear uh, states. Of course, they have different uh, interests among themselves, but I leave that for what it is. Um, the inspiration that came from the Landmine Treaty and from the Chemical Weapons Treaty gave a lot of countries a very sensible view of, well, is this Article 6 of the NPT is not leading to what we expect the nuclear states to do, but instead they are modernizing their postures, erosing arms control regimes. It was my conviction that we have to work with them. Uh, and in itself, the, the, the idea of trying to strengthen Article 6 also by a strategy which could lead uh, to uh, a nuclear ban is something that should be pursued and should be discussed with them. Because we need, after all, a consensus in the world. We can continue with this division, but we have to stretch our hand out and seriously uh, stretch our hands out. Um, the opposition was virulent from my NATO colleagues. We were the only ones, uh, and I've had many uh, countries coming to me, say, you can go into this, this is not uh, you know, in agreement with uh, your NATO responsibilities, which we take very, very seriously as, as the Netherlands. We have most of the international missions uh, from Afghanistan to elsewhere. So I wasn't totally convinced of the need to take such a brusque view to many countries. We're talking now about 117 countries or something like that that are in the process of ratification. There's a reason why. I was not naive also about that these negotiations could also lead to an opposition to two groups of nations that could not be productive. A bridge is always difficult because if you have difference of interest, it's not easy where, where, where it will go and we are not the biggest country around either. So we have, uh, in good faith, negotiated with it. I found the negotiations extremely uh, difficult uh, because they were also more and more a opposition uh, as a reaction maybe to, the, to the, the harsh position of the nuclear states in not looking at key issues that were, were, were brought in by the Netherlands but also by other countries. You see now Sweden is actually thinking, should we, uh, not a NATO country, maybe looking to NATO membership at some point, I don't know, but is this actually helping us or not? There were a few things I was really in disagreement with, which is also in the statement we had, and that's why we voted against. Uh, uh, first of all, on verification. I think the verification is so key. I mean, you go even, even a step backwards. And I don't really know why it was so difficult for some of the countries uh, to go further in this. I think if you, if you don't make that a cornerstone even if you might differ among yourselves, because this is also a group of about 170 countries. This was key. So I found that probably the most difficult part of it. Secondly, there was never a time element. We have brought in a time element. If you are organizing a meeting and the, non -nuclear, the nuclear states don't want to participate, but actually you don't want them with, them with you actually either, then of course you don't, in the end it doesn't lead to success. So what we try to do with some other countries is at least also to put a time element. Uh, yes, we are part of a nuclear alliance, as long as nuclear uh, weapons exist. You need a time element to get rid of it, otherwise we would be immediately illegal if we would sign it and vote yes. Uh, so that would be impossible, and we did not get room for maneuver in that context sufficiently, in my view, to put any of these time elements in. There were quite a few countries that are willing to do so, but the majority was against, and this goes in the, in, in the, in the nuclear ban uh, um, negotiations to a large extent on the basis of simple majorities. So I thought both the time element and the verification in the context of our nuclear responsibilities, which we are willing uh, you know, to go to global zero, was in my view not, not very convincing, and it was very sloppy. Very sloppy negotiations. They ended in the beginning, they, they, there was such a speed on it, which I think was not necessary. A lot of legal terms are simply not well defined, 
And you might think this is a detail, but it isn't. When we talk about nuclear weapons, around verification, around uh, uh, nuclear umbrellas, around responsibilities, around testing, you have to be very, very precise. So it was impossible to vote, in, at least from my point of view, from the point of view of the Dutch government, to vote in favor. Now you can say, okay, look, you're part of a negotiation, you vote no, so what in the end changed? Not much, but I want to say this. I think if we continue uh, you know, uh, to be so strongly, uh, both from NATO's side as from the other side, in opposing any bridge building, then that's not good. We lose more and more countries. We had a middle power initiative in, 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 in the beginning of this millennium. There are countries that want to productively make a, a bridge, uh, but I see them going to a more extreme side. And my, my call is here at least, uh, when it comes, for instance, and let me give you two examples, what could help in confidence building is the, uh, the, the strengthening of the comprehensive test ban treaty uh, organization, which, by the way, is already active in some of the issues around uh, uh, North Korea, uh, but also the fissile material cut-off uh, treaty. I would love if the United Kingdom, together with Germany and the Netherlands and Canada, is supporting now the, the, the speeding up uh, of this, because that might be a major confidence building measure. It really is another way of you know, stopping or at least limiting this modernization process, which goes counter to the wishes of so many most of all, if you think about another treaty, the START Treaty, which runs out in 2021, yeah. and we need a new... What do you think about that, if those are talking about these treaty prospects? Um, frankly, I do think uh, it's a different treaty, but my, let's, first of all, my fear is, obviously, if, if we do not work now on INF, politically more active in terms of the present possibility still, or trying to work around... Uh, medium-range uh, ballistic missiles uh, in, in a multilateral room, it will speed up the logic of also giving up START, which looks then very likely. It looks very likely anyway. I'm against it because I think erosion of the arms regime is the, is the worst thing we can do right now for all the reasons I, I, I mentioned. Uh, and I, I think we need a lot of, of uh, political pressure to, to, to work on, on the different parties to, to contain this. Uh, but I'm not very optimistic about it, frankly. Um, Baron Mazzelli. Good afternoon and welcome. Can I ask you uh, two questions about NATO's role in nuclear diplomacy? And uh, th this is a theme that has already been running underneath all the questions so far, so I'd like to pinpoint two questions. Uh, the first is uh, what actions the Alliance could take collectively to reduce nuclear risk? Uh, I appreciate you've already referred to importance of communication channels between NATO and Russia, and you've mentioned NATO-Russia Council. Um, so perhaps you might want to develop that further, or are there other steps that NATO allies could take? But certainly something specifically relating to your position um, as a citizen of the Netherlands and having been uh, uh, the foreign minister there. Um, what, to what extent do you think the perspectives of allies that are plus participating in nuclear sharing might differ from other NATO allies. And uh, in also asking those questions, like Claude Hannay, I should declare an interest as a member of the European Leadership Network, to which you already refer. Um, let me start with the first question. This is a risky remark because I don't like the word politicization. I don't know a better word. Maybe it's the ignorance of my English. And it, because it's also very risky. But we need to make issues around uh, nuclear reviews in the US or in NATO a bit more transparent and political. I think that is possible. Of course, there are a lot of secrets around this. And, you know, you don't put everything on the table. This is very logical. But I feel very much in my time this, is, this has become very depoliticized. There is not anymore a, an issue of consultation of NATO. What is strategic stability right now? And how do we deal with this in a time of completely different geopolitical and technological situation? We just adapt. Uh, it's part the, the, the past and it's part modernization of individual countries. I'm not so sure that, that in the end that is good enough. 
but that's a very general answer, I realize that. Secondly, there are, of course, quite a few um, things we can be more transparent around. I have, I, it's still not possible for me to say if in my country we have nuclear weapons or not, uh, if we have this umbrella situation or not, simply because it is confidential. I could not say this to my parliament. My parliament has instructed me to discuss with all the allies to give opening of, of facts around this. And I can do it. I haven't done it. I won't do it today. But I think it's silly. It doesn't help anything to our security, let me tell you that. I don't know any analysis that some of the transparency on this would reduce our international uh, security. Uh, I was saying something about uh, issues where we have to work much more on in NATO immediately. That is, in my view, the issue of the role of nuclear weapons in our strategies and the reduction of that, which is one of the promises we made in, the, in, in, in uh, NPT 2010. Uh, and if there is any uh, two elements, I think I mentioned that already, that, that, that require first attention is cybersecurity and nuclear installations. I cannot judge the risk, but according to experts, it's, it's you know, something that, and we talk about cybersecurity and our energy and our communication and our infrastructure and our hospitals and, 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 and what we see in our political arena sometimes, then definitely the risks to, okay, very well protected nuclear systems is, is more than ever. Uh, important to do so. I think it's important that we go back to some ideas which can create this uh, discussion in NATO of the relationship with strategic stability and arms control as I said by detargeting, creating a little bit more time uh, for uh, decision making, uh, increasing the security of launching systems. All these things are not very much part of a political debate and I don't mean a political debate, party political every day but one that is substantiated in a NATO uh, a dialogue, uh, including the, the raising the, the threshold for, for the use of nuclear weapons. So on the nuclear file, I would think these are the, the most important. Um, on the umbrella, so I cannot say that much about it, except that um, this discussion will come up. What is public is, of course, that, that five nations, uh, including Italy and Belgium and the Netherlands, you know, have American, uh, there are American nuclear bombs as part of the strategy. Now, the question will, I think, be the following one. In the context of INF, will in the modernization plans, uh, for, for instance, the F-35, which we are getting also in, in the Netherlands, will there be a modernized nuclear bomb or not? That will be a debate which will be discussed by different sides of the political spectrum. There will be those who say we don't need this modernization at all. Uh, let's not have it. In this case, I'm from that side. But there are two other views, I think. One is uh, we should do it anyway because we had it and it's simply modernization. So there's nothing new about it. Why should we change it at the moment that the other side is, uh, is, is, is doing things we don't like? And the third is if we have a perceived or real threat on these new systems from the Russian Federation. Uh, it's better to do this than a ground-launched ballistic system, and this might be a way to keep the nuclear sharing between the United States and Europe. Of course, there have been some very initial discussions in Europe on a Euro deterrent. You probably follow that, and we should, you know, because of the state of the transatlantic relationships, uh, you know, it, it will be in the end, the, the Article 5 is under discussion, maybe there should be a year to return. This is an old debate, which I've always found a very risky one, and those who are against that would, would plead for nuclear sharing and modernization there. So this will be the part of the debate, I think, that will come up uh, around the end of the INF Treaty. The answer to that, is it necessary or not? Or do we not necessarily have to mirror an answer? And if we answer, do we do this on the ground? Or if we cannot negotiate this away in another form? Minister, you're sitting here in London and we have certain preoccupations, as you, as you know, with, uh, Sorry, uh, we, uh, with our with European you. friends. <laughs> um, but what, uh, what actions do you think specifically the UK, what would you sort of recommend as a friend? The UK should be... Uh, pursuing in the uh, forthcoming RevCon and in the whole uh, 
non-proliferation scene. And in addition to that, do you expect a sort of collective voice from NATO, presumably through the Secretariat, of which you are a key part, uh, also on this issue? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't get the last part of your question. Well, um, is, does the NATO Secretariat have a sort of organized voice, an input to the Revcon? Do you expect... Ah, okay. Is that, does that happen? Yeah. To be very honest, I cannot answer the last question simply because I'm not anymore in office and I haven't followed that. I think normally they are not. It's a matter of, of member states and sometimes it's, I think, negotiated also in the EU framework. If it's wise or not to do that, I doubt it because I think it's very difficult to get an agreement on this. Um, but take this, this answer with a lot of limitations because I... I simply am not aware of, of, of what is happening exactly on that front right now, since I'm, I'm too long out of that element of uh, what happens in, 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 in uh, NATO. May I make one general remark, not because today you're also discussing other issues in, in, in the UK. I think it is very important, whatever your decisions are on Brexit and on the future, uh, that the United Kingdom remains a part of this discussion in a European context. And I'm actually convinced that you will, but I think it's also important to underline it, whatever the views here are, and I definitely, definitely don't want to get into that. Um, but this issue of our common security, our arrangements in defense cooperation, our visions around arms control, I think the, the role of the United Kingdom as a Security Council member and one of the P5 and a nuclear power, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and that's why I hope also in some of the discussions that we will have uh, in, in, in the coming months in the preparations of this uh, nuclear proliferation, but also on INF, that the link of the United Kingdom uh, uh, transatlantic as well with the European partners could be very key on this, if it's very proactive. The problem is a little bit, not with the UK, but with all of us, that you know, we have so many internal issues, and we, I see that in general Europe is, is, is in, to a certain extent also UK, is absent in an enormous amount of discussions at the moment when it comes to global security. It's a bit frightening to me. I've seen the miss, uh, uh, and it goes out of the discussion of Brexit, but, you know, the, the weakness of the European Council on Foreign Affairs, the lack of any coherent vision on our security then we leave it also simply to others who take the initiative. And I, let me just mention a few that I thought was imp were, were important. Uh, uh, one is try in some way, in any case, to make the link with the non-nuclear states. Uh, it will be a difficult relationship, but it's important to do so. See to what extent you could be part of these discussions that are now with some European allies on promoting this Vissau uh, Kadhaf uh, Treaty, Vissau Material Kadhaf Treaty. Um, th th I think it's very important, including on the, 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 the comprehensive test ban uh, treaty organization. These are simply things that help to build uh, confidence as well. Uh, and let's be very active as Europeans among ourselves, NATO Europeans, I mean, in this sense, on how we make this a consultative mechanism and how we deal with the, the, uh, the uh, short-range ballistic missiles and how you can be instrumental as a key component in that P5 to get that discussion going. I think uh, there are many other things. I think in the preparation it's important to be transparent and have all these regional sessions take others seriously in this debate. My fear is, is, is not necessarily a repeat of 2015 in which I think it was the UK, Canada and the US who could in the end not agree on, on the outcome of the uh, review conference. I hope we, we don't get into that discussion. That it's a discussion on the real issues of, of uh, nuclear safety and uh, the risks that we have in this world. Well, Minister, you've been very frank and uh, your views are very valuable to us. So I was just thinking while you were speaking, and maybe <laughs> with America going, we're not quite sure where, uh, with the Russians still playing the Putin game for the moment, yes. uh, perhaps we have to reinvent new forums, uh, regardless of the Brexit issue, in order to carry on really close focus and dialogue on all these issues, day and night, continuously. Absolutely. I think that's the story for the future. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for being with us. I'm most grateful for you. It's been a great help. Thank you. It's been an honor to be with you. And I thank wish you, you all the best with your work. Thank you.